everyone. Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, and our guest today is Liz Dimmick. Liz is a special educator. She teaches at Dummerston School, and she also does out-of-district case management at such places as Kindle Farm and The Retreat. She was born and raised here in Brattleboro, and she now lives in town with her husband and two young children. So we are glad today to have Liz with us. Welcome, Liz. Hi. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's great to have you on the show. Um, and uh, you lived your, you've lived your whole life here in Brattleboro, though you were away at school a couple different times. Um, mm -hmm. But when you were growing up in, in Brattleboro, you went K through 12 in schools here. And um, I know that you, uh, you went to St. Michael's and then you ended up at the middle school and the high school. And in that range of time, um, were there things that you were particularly involved in or that you were really attracted to doing? Uh, sure. So I was, um, you know, often involved in different activities through the rec department. Um, I, I did a lot of dance classes mm -hmm. at the Brattleboro School of Dance. Um, loved doing classes there and I was very involved. Um, and I continued with that all the way through high school. Um, things I like to do, I mean, we were always involved in the community as a family, um, and, you know, took advantage of the different, um, different outdoor things that you can do in this area, which I think we are all appreciating so much now that we are right. all working from home. Um, so that's really it. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. You covered a lot of bases. And that's one thing that was that was great during that time as well is that there were a lot of things available for kids. And I know that many of you at that age got to know each other through places like the rec center or the dance center or um, or doing various sports. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and, mm -hmm. you, so, and both your parents were teachers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My dad teacher at the high school and the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom was a teacher before I was born. And then after I was born, she did a daycare in our, our home mm -hmm. for a number of years. And then um, once my sister, who was the youngest in the family, was in school full time, my mom started working at Green Street mm -hmm. School. Um, so yeah, both my parents were involved in the public schools here in Brattleboro. Yeah. So that must have had a bit of an influence on you, having two, two parents who were both teachers. Yeah, I mean, when it came time to choose a college and think about what I was going to do, it was like, well, teaching is what my grandfather was an educator before my parents, um, so it was very prevalent in my family. Yes, so. yeah, yeah. Um, and so you went on to UVM, and you were mm -hmm. entered in early elementary education. So you were yes, first. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I majored in elementary ed, and I had this vision that I was going to teach kindergarten, first or second grade, and that was it. There were no grades higher than that that I would be doing. Um, and of course, you know, when we're twenty, we're living in a dream world. Um, <laughs> and but a nice dream world, after, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, no. But it was reality though. So, um, so yeah, I always thought I would just do one of the very lower grades in the early elementary ed. Um, and of course now I've taught at all grade levels, um, all the way through high school and, and post high school with, yeah. uh, kids with disabilities. So, mm -hmm. so it was, it's all, almost all special needs kids. Yeah, my first job was in um, public education in a regular ed classroom. I took a job at um, Hinsdale Elementary School um, over a Labor Day weekend right after I graduated from college. That was my first job um, and taught fourth grade um, and pretty quickly realized like, oh my goodness, I need to know a lot more about special education. Um, and I finished out that one year. Um, and then shortly after that, I started working at a school in New York, north of New York City. So in, um, 
it was in the Poughkeepsie area. Um, and I started working at a school that was a residential placement for kids and adults with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was there, I thought even more, you know, I really need to learn more about special education. And that's when I decided to go back and get my master's in special ed. Mm -hmm. um, and then ever since, I've been working with kids and adults with disabilities. And that's been my focus since. So all ages, all ages, yeah. kids through adults. That must have been yeah. a real, um, that must have been a real immersion when you were working at that facility for adults and children. Yes, yeah. So I started out working in their school program. Um, and I was working in a uh, self contained classroom um, with kids with pretty severe developmental disabilities. Um, some kids were nonverbal. Um, and so, you know, that was definitely a, a steep learning curve for me at the time. Um, and then I started working at their day hab program. Um, and I was working with some young adults, young men who had just come out of high school and were transitioning into adulthood, but they were living at this school and they were living in group homes. Um, so we were doing things in the community, um, working in jobs and I was working sort of as a job coach for them. Um, and so, you know, that, is something even though it's in the realm of special education it's uh you know vastly different than what i do now in the classroom at dummerston school um yeah. so you know the range of things that um that we do as special educators can be really a wide range depending on where you're working and what your focus is maybe maybe it's not unique to special education maybe it's just education in general um is that idea of being really flexible um and knowing that every kid or every group of kids that you work with are going to need something very different um and in some ways it could almost be a little bit like acting um and that you put on a certain persona for each group of kids that you work with um you know i know that i have to behave in a certain way or interact in a certain way depending on the group of kids i'm working with mm -hmm. um and the range for the range of kinds of things i need to focus on changes um and is very wide based on which group of kids I'm working with. And so that's something that I think is, maybe it is unique to special education. And that idea that, you know, you're working with different groups of kids throughout a school day, yeah. you know, whereas a classroom teacher is working with the same group of kids over mm -hmm. the course of the year, um, every day and for the, the whole day or most of the school day. And as special educators, we see kids for short periods of time to work on really intense um, mm. skill building work in a specific area. So I think that's something that is maybe unique to special education um, and definitely something I have worked on over time. You know, that idea that I have to kind of be a different teacher for a different group of kids, depending on who the kids are. Yeah, that's well, that's very interesting. And I think it's it's also um, interesting that you liken it to acting because you are able to shift uh, shift gears in a way that you can come forward, I would think, that would be very applicable to the situation that you're in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely, I definitely feel like I have a different persona for different groups of kids throughout yeah. the school day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's something that I've sort of learned over time yeah. as I've worked with kids in special ed. So, so Liz, um, of, of all of the age groups that you've worked with over the years, do you have a particular affinity for anyone or two in particular? Sure. So I, um, there's something about working with the youngest kids um, that I really love. And I think some of it is just how in, innocent and eager they are to learn. Um, and I think something that's unique to our youngest learners is that they're still so excited about school and excited about learning. Yeah. And it's, it's common for kids who are identified as needing special ed services 
to become discouraged or frustrated um, or even feel like, you know, down about themselves as learners over time. Um, and that's not true of every child, obviously, but, but I think it's more common as kids go through the grade levels. And so yeah. there's something about the young of kids that I just love so much um, because they're all so excited and they're not comparing themselves to each other as learners. And right. They're all trying their hardest. Um, yeah. So I think that's something I just really love about the littlest kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, when you're, um, are you on your own or do you have a, a team of some kind that you work with? Yeah, I work, so right now at Dummerston School, um, I've been at Dummerston for a number of years and my role has changed you know, a little bit each year. And some of that is because Dummerston is a really small school. Um, and so our students with special needs, you know, the, the numbers change and um, sometimes it can adjust. Um, so sometimes my job changes. But right now at Dummerston, I'm working with grades pre-K to four. Um, and so I work most closely with the teachers in those grades. Um, and depending on my student caseload, um, I work more closely with certain teachers. So right now I have four students who are identified in the second grade. So I spend a great deal of time with the second grade teacher. Right. Uh -huh. um, so it just depends based on my numbers, um, how that looks. In but in general, in general, you're going into a school and working with a certain amount of kids for certain times. In the midst of all this, Liz, uh, of teaching for a number of years with um, a lot of different kinds of kids. Uh, you and your husband at some point became foster parents. And I wonder yeah. if you could talk about that a bit because, you know, um, I know that uh, it's, it's sort of a whole world that a lot of us, if we're not in it, we don't know what it's about and what the procedure mm -hmm. is the process. So if you could give us a little idea of that, that'd be great. Sure. So, um, Six years ago, my husband and I decided um, to get into learning more about foster care in our area. We did not have any biological children. Um, and so we started simply by signing up for the classes that DCF here in town offers. Um, there's a series of classes that they offer at night, um, and it's nothing too intense, but it does give you a little insight into just what fostering is all about and how it works. Um, and so we started by doing the classes and we were still, you know, trying to decide what that might look like for us. Um, and of course with DCF, um, you know, their needs are really high. Um, and so they called us a couple of different times to see if we would consider taking a foster child. Um, and so initially we both felt like, okay, we're not totally ready for this. Um, and then we got a call and it was just, it was just the right fit for us. Um, it was really important to us at the time that we consider taking in a child who was going to potentially be available for adoption. Um, and that was just one of the criteria that was important to us. Um, and so we started fostering a six-year-old six years ago now. Um, and she came to us as a foster child um, in DCF custody. And she had been in a residential placement prior to coming to us. Um, and so we fostered her for um, a series of months and pretty soon after that she became available for adoption mm -hmm. um, and so we worked with DCF on that and we ended up adopting her a year and a half later um, and now she is 12 wow. um, it's hard to believe um, she's amazing and she's growing up really fast um, and we never in a million years thought that we were going to, first of all, that we were going to become foster parents and adopt through DCF. Uh -huh. um, and secondly, we never imagined that we would take in a six-year-old. We were thinking, you know, infants. Yes. Um, 
And that just was not the way it went for us. And that is, I'm so grateful for that now. Mm -hmm. um, since then, we had another child come into our home um, four years ago now. And she, we adopted her. It took a little longer with her. So she was in foster care with us for longer. And then we just adopted her this past December. Oh. Um, she is now six. Uh -huh. um, so we have a 12 year old and a six year old. Uh -huh. um, and working from home with two school aged kids is definitely a challenge. <laughs> um, but it's also wonderful. And I wouldn't, you know, I mean, this is definitely the road that was meant for us. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we would consider taking in more children. It just would have to be the right fit for us. But, um, but for anyone out there who's even thinking or wondering about fostering or foster care, you know, I encourage you to reach out to anyone you know or even reach out to DCF um, because I know there's a really high need in our area. Right, there's a high, yes, yes, I've heard that too. And, and just to be clear for folks, DCF is Department of Children and Families. And, yeah. uh, and so you went to, um, to uh, like workshops that they, the, they talked to you about it and they, they got you educated and a little bit skilled about what you were getting into. And I know yeah. that, that um, DCF, it's a, it's a complex system. Um, many times it does take, as you say, a long time to get through. Yeah. Um, and, you know, certainly, again, I think in our community, we're probably pretty lucky that we are not mammoth and urban um, with so many, so many kids needing to be placed. Yeah. And, um, and I wonder if, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, um, about working in the system and if you, if you worked with the, with the birth mother or parents and yeah. the complexity of that kind of situation as well. Sure. So, Wendy, you mentioned that we live in a smaller community here in Brattleboro. Um, and actually, the, um, the mom of one of my kids, my oldest, Mary, um, her mom is actually someone that I grew up with yeah. and had a relationship with when I was younger as a child myself. Yeah. Um, and so that situation was unique. Um, and I don't think that happens a lot in, in DCF um, custody situations, but in her case, you know, we had a pretty, um, a pretty good working relationship with Mary's mom, um, mm -hmm. and we still have a good relationship, um, but it is definitely something that, that came as part of being a foster parent. Um, you know, kids in DCF custody often especially at the beginning stages, um, you know, they still have mandated visits with their birth families, oh. um, you know, and it's different in every kid's situation. Um, but that was something that happened for both of my children with their birth mothers for, um, for a while. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, for several months in Mary's situation and it was for almost two years in Ginger's situation. Um, you know, and I now, you know, have relationships with both of their moms. Um, you know, and I don't want to say that it's like always perfect um, or that we're like best friends, but in our situation, you know, we, we communicate um, and it is definitely something that, that comes with um, considering foster care because mm -hmm. those kids still have you know, they still have relationships with people um, from their lives. You know, Mary spent six years, bef you know, with her mom before she came to us. And that's a, you know, that's a big chunk of time. And that's still a really important part of her life and her development. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that's definitely been a part of our, um, our world as we've become parents. Yes, and you know, I think too, you know, it really speaks to the fact that you certainly have a lot of skill sets um, in in deal interpersonal relationships, familiar, yeah. 
and um, and again that uh, the community is small so so there are apt to be these relationships that will continue on um, and yeah. and I, I think it's a wonderful message though to put out there first of all that um, foster parents in general are very much needed in the area yes. there are many kids yeah, who, absolutely. Who, who are in need so for people to know that um, and also that um, there is a system in place you know that they can yes. follow and people and mentors that they can be in touch with um, so that's all that's all great information for for people to know um, mm -hmm. you know it sort of moves us into um, the pandemic and yeah. how, how you are faring during that now here you are um, I, I was very curious to know, um, first of all, um, you have um, a, a kids that you are in touch with that you see regularly, special needs kids at these various schools. Mm -hmm. What's happening now during the pandemic? How are you keeping an eye on them or are, are you in touch in any way? Yeah, so um, the Agency of Education um, has given us directives as special educators um, because they you know they're still mandating that we are delivering special education services to students even though schools are closed every student who is identified as a um, special education student has what's called an individualized education plan right we we call that an iep for short um and so every kid that has an iep um has this plan in place for how the types of services that they will receive related to special education and um, how those services are being delivered and the frequency and all of that is laid out in the plan because we are closed and we can't be meeting with kids directly the agency of education has um, given us the directive that we create what are called distance learning plans. Um, and this is new for everybody, um, everywhere. Um, and so what we've had to do is create a plan with the family, with the parents of the child, um, for how we're going to attempt to deliver some semblance of the special education services that their child has been receiving mm -hmm. while they're in school. Mm -hmm. And so, so we've created these plans with families and then based on those plans, you know, different families have different needs. Um, and so some students we meet through Zoom and we do instruction. Um, other students, we send work um, remotely through email or other applications. Um, and then there are some kids, like I have a couple of kids, very few, but I have a couple of kids who don't have internet access. And in those situations that it's been particularly hard because you know, so much of our world right now is happening in, you know, the, it's happening remotely. Right. Um, and so for those kids, we've had to send, you know, physical paperwork um, to their homes or deliver them with the food delivery that's happening through the school district. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so there are multi, uh, uh, multiple different ways that we're trying to meet yes. those student needs. But yeah. yeah, so a lot of my kids I visit through Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do instruction through sh screen sharing um, mm -hmm. methods. And other times I'm like holding up the note card here at the screen. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. It, just, it depends on the kid. And it yes. Depends on that's how we're doing it. Of, of course, you know, there's no way really, these are kids who are being tracked, who are already, you know, in the system in some way. And so there's no real way of identifying the kids who are at risk in other ways. And that's, yeah. you know, that's one thing that I'm sure crops up for you and for everybody else who's involved in this. Um, and so for you personally, you're home, you're homeschooling, you're also keeping track of all of the other students that you're involved with. How's it going, Liz? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, this is hard. It's really hard. Um, and, you know, the time is flying. I am shocked that we have been in this for now, this is week nine, am I right? Sounds nine? Like, that sounds about right. Um, so I'm amazed at how quickly the time is going. Um, I am amazed at how resilient the kids I'm working with are. I'm amazed at how resilient my own kids have been. Um, don't get me wrong, they're at each other uh, 
here and now. Um, but you know, we, we have, we've kind of developed a flow to our day. You know, we do a check-in every morning about who's got zoom meetings, what time are the zoom meetings, who gets to be in the kitchen on a meeting and Uh where does everybody else need to be? Um, So it definitely takes a lot of organization as far as like who's doing what and when, Um, especially because, you know, Mary who is in fifth grade can be pretty independent. Um, Ginger is in kindergarten and I can't expect that she's able to just hop online and do all of her work on her own. So the balance is definitely something we've had to work on uh, Mm -hmm. for sure. So. Yes. And, and the balance of energy as well, you know, not getting yeah. totally <laughs> strung out. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And also your, your husband is also in the school system in, in Springfield, I believe. Right. So yeah. 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 So, so he's, um, he's actually the superintendent of schools in Springfield, Vermont, um, which means, and he's also working completely from home. He's not going into the office at all. Um, so, um, that means that a lot of times he has meetings like into the night um, because he has school board meetings or negotiations. Um, And so we've had to like set up every bathroom with toothbrushes and nighttime meds and whatever we need so that if he's having a meeting in one part of the house, we're not interrupting the meeting to do our bedtime routine. so, you know, it just takes a little bit of organization and a little bit of flexibility of everybody. A, a little bit is a little bit of a euphemism, I think. I mean, more more power to you. It's it's incredible yeah. what you have to do. And, you know, I know that you're not alone in um, having these kinds of schedules. So, Definitely not. Yeah, this yeah, is so. everybody's dealing with this. I yeah. keep saying anybody who has kids at home and is trying to work full time, good, you know, good luck. You know, we're all trying to do the best that we can do. Um, and, you know, in so many ways, it's so great because, you know, there's, you know, there's the, the big banners that are going around town stronger together. I mean, we do know in so many ways that we are in this together, you know, even totally. yeah. being with other or being able to be with each other. But um, it's, it's wonderful to, um, it's wonderful to talk to you, Liz, and to, to get some inside stories here about um, the things that you do. And, and also for, you know, for those of us in the community to know more about how kids are being taken care of and how, how things are working. And this is a unique time. So um, it, calls for, it calls for unique talents and skills. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I so appreciate you talking with me, Wendy. It's so great to just, you know, talk about our story and, and uh, connect with other people who are also going through these hard times right now. So, yeah, well, thank you, Liz. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, we will be in touch. And we, um, I, I will think of you when, <laughs> when I think about bedtime and having to scurry yeah. around and get your toothbrushes together. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us today and to hear what Liz does and the kind of um, kind of things that she's involved in in the school system, our local school system and the kids and their needs. And um, we appreciate you tuning in and we ask you to stay tuned to BCTV and all of our different shows that are on and uh, tune into your neighbors. We will see you again next week.